In the following, I'm going to give you a summary about respiratory failure. What is the function of the respiratory failure? The function is basically to supply the body with oxygen for the aerobic metabolism and to remove its major metabolic waste product, the carbon dioxide. This takes about 0.2 to 4 liters per minute does it by three district mechanisms, such as the ventilation that delivers ambient air to the alveoli, diffusion, when the oxygen is going to diffuse from the air to the capillary wall, through the capillary wall to the blood, and oxygenate the hemoglobin, and in return, the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse backward to the alveoli and exhaled. Another one, the circulation. The oxygenated hemoglobin should be transferred to the periphery and the waste products from the periphery should be carried back to the alveoli, to the lung. Before we start, we should summarize what the alveolar pressure or what does the what is the partial pressure that we are talking about the oxygen the carbon dioxide the partial pressure usually is taking out the whole compartment of the alveoli and this is going to be summarized where the content of the air the air is going to contain nitrogen the major product water the ev evaporated water co2 and PO2 and these all takes are the oil pressure that you would find in the pressure outside and the portion what we do have is separated so the major portion of the pressure is the nitrogen and carbon dioxide and oxygen these are the two other major components Some important data before we start about the circulatory and respiratory system. The oxygen consumption of the body is about 200 ml per minute. The oxygen carrying capacity of the blood about 1 liter per minute. So if uh, you calculate it, the, and the peripheral oxygen extraction is about 25%. So we do have a huge amount of oxygen carrying capacity and the consumption relatively is a low amount. The lung circulation is around five liter per minute. This is a cardiac output. And the alveolar ventilation is about roughly a bit, bit, four liters plus minus maybe 0.5 liters. The ventilation and perfusion ratio is for the total lung is about 0.8. The alveolar gas oxygen tension is 100 millimercury. The alveolar gas carbon dioxide tension is about 40 millimercury. The arterial oxygen is about 250 ml per minute. The hemoglobin saturation of the arterial hemoglobin is about 99%. The arterial oxygen content is about 200 ml per minute. And the arterial pressure, uh, partial pressure of the carbon dioxide is 40 millimercury. In the venous side, the oxygen content is around 150 milliliter per minute. In central venous hemoglobin saturation, about 75%, so 25% is extraction. The central venous oxygen content is around 40 millimercury, while the central venous carbon dioxide pressure is 46 millimercury. The respiration is independent, uh, is dependent on the vital links of the various anatomic subcompartment, at least about seven subcompartments that we do have, such as the central nervous system, the spinal cord, how the impulse goes to the neuromuscular system, and the thorax and the pleura, 
why the upper airways, the air comes in, and the lower airways and the alveoli, and the cardiovascular system that is going to take the blood to the periphery. So these seven autonomic subcompartments, whose functions are vital to the maintenance of normal respiration, interruption in the function of any of the links has serious complications for the functioning of the system as a whole. What be the effect of the hypoxia? The hypoxia is going to signaling the effectors and going to activate the ion channel and transcriptional factors. The acute effect of the hypoxia that immediately is going to stimulate the ventilation, so it causes hyperventilation. But not only the lung ventilation will increase, but the heart rate is going to increase as be causing pulmonary vasoconstriction and systemic arterial vasodilation and the arteriosus ducts relaxation. In a chronic situation, when it's ongoing for a long time, the activation of the glucose metabolism and transport system, the erythropoiesis will increase due to the erythropoietic, increased erythropoietic level, the angiogenesis and neurovascularization, tissue hypertrophy, remodeling, and production of different vasodilators. The effect of a hypoxia on the brain function. If we do have a normally saturated uh, arterial blood, the brain functioning normally. However, when we are going to lose the saturation or the, the oxygen, it's between about 80-60%, the patient will have decreased visual sensitivity. And below 60, impaired memory and calculation function, and below 40, impairment judgment, impaired coordination, and unconsciousness in hours. If you go down below 20s in minutes or in seconds, the patient will be unconscious. That's very similar when you go to the high altitude. If you are over 5,000 meters, that's, you can lose your consciousness. This is why you have to go slowly and you have to take some rest to accommodate to the less oxygen tension that you will have. Let's continue with the control of the breathing mechanism. There are central receptors and chemoreceptors that is going to sense the carbon dioxide tension or the acidity. This respiratory center is located in the medulla oblongata. The pH, because the behind of the blood borne barrier, this is why the carbon dioxide is diffusing a less to the blood barrier and the hydrogen ion concentration mainly, this is what is going to interfere with the respiratory center. In the periphery, we do have chemoreceptor as well, especially the carotid bodies in the carotis and the arch of the aorta, and is sensitive, sensitive to the pH and the PCO2 and in a hypoxic signal as well. There are some mechanoreceptors in the lung and the chest wall that relatively is triggered by the mechanical stretch and chemical irritation. The J receptors, that's a juxtapapillar, uh, juxtacapillar localization, and the blood volume and the interstitial edema is sensed by this way. Now, uh, the ventilation responds to the physiologic stimuli. Hypercapnia. You do have a linear correlation between the carbon dioxide tension, increase of carbon dioxide tension, and the breathing. Uh, this is linear between 40 millimercury and 70 millimercury. It's the axis around or the slope is about 3 liters per minute per millimercury. Hypoxia is going to stimulate the breathing center, but it has to be as low as 50 to 55 millimercury of the peer arterial oxygen tension. The metabolic acidosis that is going to stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors that causes hyperventilation and that's going to remove the PCO2 and later it's going to diffuse into let's see the central nervous system. So the whole activation or whole maximum stimuli needs about one or two days. Metabolic alkalosis 
on the alkalemia, the peripheral chemoreceptor is going to be suppressed and hypoventilation it will cause an increase of the CO2 values and later this is going to diffuse into the central nervous system and that further compensation is available. Let's look at some different diseases that is going to alter and altering the control of the breathing mechanism. The first one, if you do have, for example, a resection of the carotid body, that is the nervous 9 is not, or the nervous 9 is compressed, there's no signal goes to the oblongata. Another, some kind of diseases that includes the oblongata, get caused by infection, bleeding, trauma, or syringomyelia, or certain drugs. In the spinal cord, for example, a transection, or polymyelitis, or a nerve problems such as a Guillain-Barre syndrome, or muscular problem in myasthenia gravis or myotonic dystrophy, always can cause a problem. And another problem, for example, that can be due to the airways obstruction or thoracic case alterations such as the obesity or kifocoliosis. In syringomyelia, the disorders in which the cyst or cavity forms within the spinal cord and this cyst called syrinx can expand and elongate over time and destroying the spinal cord. In the Guillain-Barre syndrome is an acute polyneuropathy affecting the peripheral nervous system that ascending paralyzes weakness beginning in the feet and hands and migrating towards the trunk. It can cause respiratory failure. This is usually triggered by an infection. Myasthenia gravis this is an autoimmune neuromuscular disease leading to a fluctuating muscle weakness and fatigability. The circulating antibody blocks the acetylcholine receptors at the prosympathetic neuromuscular conjunction and that's causing an abnormality of the nerve transmission. Myotonic dystrophia or dystrophia myotonica or myotonia atrophica. It is a chronic slowly progressing inherited multisystem disease. It is characterized by wasting of the muscle, muscles dystrophy, cataracts, heart condition defects and endocrine changes and myotonia. There are two types of these diseases. One is the myotonic dystrophy type 1 or DM1, also called as a Steiner's disease, has a severe congenital form and a milder childhood onset form. The affected gene is called DMPK, which codes for the myotonic dystrophy protein kinase. The second type, the myotonic dystrophy type 2 or DM2, also called proximal myotonic myopathy, that's a PROMN, or adult onset form is rarer than DM1 and generally manifest with a milder signs and symptoms. Myotonic dystrophy can occur in patients of any age. Both forms of this disease display an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. The affected gene is called ZNF9, which code for the protein contains seven zinc finger domains and is believed to function as an RNA binding protein. The abnormal breathing pattern. Before I show you the abnormal breathing pattern, let's have some terminological aspect. The apnoe that's usually called is a breathing when it stops at the expiration. And apneusia, there's a breathing that stops in inspiration. In the following video that you can watch in the YouTube as well, I'm going to demonstrate the different abnormal breathing pattern. Welcome back. In this video, we'll hear the different breathing patterns that you'll see in the study of your step one exam. This includes Shane Stock's breathing pattern, Cosmol's, and Biot's breathing patterns. First, we'll have to be familiar with the normal breathing pattern, Eupnea, and this will be our baseline. And it goes something like this. Next we have tachypnea, which is the rapid breathing, 
And we see this in many disorders such as pulmonary embolisms, MIs, panic disorders, and many others. And here is how it sounds like. Next we have bradypnea, which is the low frequency breathing pattern that we see in obesity and alcoholism. Next we have Biot's breathing pattern, which is the result of brain insult. Think of strokes, encephalitis, or many others. It's described as a period of apnea, followed by rapid breathing, and followed by another period of apnea. And here's the pathophysiology behind it. We know that the brain normally controls the normal breathing pattern, but in case of brain injury, the breathing center will be inhibited and will only start functioning again in case of strong stimulus. In this case, the strong stimulus is increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. And here is how it sounds like. Next we have Shane Stock's pattern, which is the result of cardiac damage. It's similar to Biot's breathing pattern because they're both preceded and followed by a period of apnea. However, Shane Stock's pattern is gradual increase followed by gradual decrease. And here is how it sounds like. And finally, we have Cosmol's breathing pattern, and we see it in acidotic states. It's similar to tachypnea, but it differs because it has long tidal waves. So it's maximum inhalation, followed by maximum exhalation, but at a very rapid rate. It makes sense, because in acidotic states, we can decrease the acidity by decreasing carbon dioxide concentration. And here's how it sounds like. Alright guys, that's all I have. Hopefully this helps and I'll see you guys later. So, another abnormal breathing pattern, such as a sleep apnea. During the sleep, a sleep apnea, that's a disorder that characterized by the abnormal pauses in the breathing or instance of abnormally low breathing during sleep. Each pause in breathing, called an apnea, can last from a few seconds to minutes and may occur 5 to 30 times or more an hour. Sleep apnea is diagnosed with an overnight sleep test called polysomnograph or sleep study. Let's look at the type of the sleep apnea. There are three major types of the sleep apnea. When, this is called a central one, we do have a problem in the respiratory center. So usually we do have a complete or a partial realization of the respiratory effort. That can be due to encephalitis or central ischemia. The obstructive one, when we do have a problem in the airways, that airways, the upper airways is obstruction, that can be due to morbid obesity, redundant pharyngeal soft tissue, reduced upper airway size due to enlarged lymphatic tissues, for example, due to a flu. At a mixed time, when these two comes together, for example, this will happen when you uh, drunk too much, and the alcohol that's relaxing the upper airways, plus is going to blunt the sensation of the hyperxia. In a following video, I'm going to demonstrate how this looks like a sleep apnea when the snoring occurs.
Now, what can be the consequence of the sleep apnea? The sleep apnea syndrome is profoundly associated with hypertension and independent of the all relevant risk factor. Arrhythmias for mild to severe. Motorcycle accidents because their, their sleep night and a, a night's sleep is not relaxing. The patient is can fall asleep uh, uh, during the driving a car or a cycle. The six times increase the accident rate compared to the general population. Now let's talk about a little bit of the pulmonary gas exchange. Everything starts in the alveoli, oxygen tension that we already said is around 100 millimercury. In the capillary blood that's leaving the alveoli, that is about the same. The arterial oxygen tension is about 90 millimercury. This is due to some kind of shunting mechanism. So the, the difference of the arterial or the alveolar oxygen tension that can be calculated with the inhaled uh, gas, oxygen gas, and you let's see, subtract a little amount of carbon dioxide that has mentioned certain shunting mechanisms. Now, as we start with the alveoli, this is the inhaled air. After this inhaled air, when it's getting into the alveoli, of course, you do have a step done. And from the capillary to the artery, and again, again a small one, and when it goes to the peripheral tissues and further into the mitochondrium, so the finally, the, the final stage in the mitochondrium, the oxygen tension is relatively very low. Now, the effectiveness of the oxygen exchange in the lung, that is what we call this alveolar arterial oxygen difference. This alveolar arterial gradient that in the idle is about zero, so they don't have any uh, difference between the arterial oxygen tension and the alveolar oxygen tension. However, as I mentioned before, we do have a small amount of right to left sh uh, shunting mechanism that takes about two to four percent, and that's the ventilation perfusion mismatch, and that's going to alter a little bit these differences. Now, this difference is depending on age, and you can calculate any time. But one thing you should remember, if this arterial, alveolar arterial gradient is greater than 20 millimercury on room air, is abnormal usually due to parenchymal abnormality of the lung. So this is a parenchymal lung disease if we do have this alveolar arterial uh, difference, partial pressure difference is bigger than 20 millimercury. Now, oxygen content of the blood because that's a major portion and that's the major factor now first of all the oxygen is carried in a form of bond to hemoglobin that's the major part a small amount of oxygen is dissolved in the plasma and you can calculate the about the oxygen content what you can uh, carry in the blood this equation is going to tell you, and the part of this equation that includes the oxygen carrying capacity of hemoglobin, the hemoglobin percentage of the saturation of oxygen, the solubility coefficients of the oxygen in the plasma, and this is what the final the partial pressure of the oxygen in arterial blood. Now let's see. Let's look at how the saturation is altered by the partial pressure of the arterial oxygen tension. This is the normal saturation curve for the hemoglobin. Normally, what we do have in the alveoli or the arterial oxygen tension is 100 millimercury. The all hemoglobin is saturated about 100%. So what will happen in this area? Usually, this is what we say that the failure occurs below 60. Why? Because if you look at this curve, you do see that it's very very small changes can occur between 60 and 80 mini 100 and 60 millimercury now this is the clinically important area because it's meaning that how much oxygen can be let's see carried by the hemoglobin in the down slope below let's see the 60 millimercury and between the 20 and 61 that's physiologically important because this is when the oxygen is diffused out from the hemoglobin binding so this is how the, the periphery the oxygenation occurs now these two areas can be shifted this hemoglobin saturation curve can be shifted 
such as for example in acidosis that can happen in the periphery this is causing the right shift this meaning that more oxygen is going to diffuse out so more hemooxygen be released from the hemoglobin binding and that can be seen a fever or 2,3 DPG for a dehydrophosphoglycerol or as has a left shift for example when we do have an alkalosis or cold area that the oxygen is diffused in a less manner to the uh, to the tissues so that can cause hypoxia by keeping the oxygen binding into the hemoglobin let's look at the following uh, little experiment we are going to combine a uh, hundred ml blood let's see the venosus blood that the oxygen is around 30 millimercury and 100 ml the fully oxygenated blood the both has the same kind of volume but as you see here the hemoglobin is the same in both cases the concentration is the same except their partial oxygen tension is different one now let's see what will be the average of this mixture okay so if you calculate now we get 200 ml and what would be let's see the oxygen uh, tension if you making a mean this is wrong this is won't be the case what you have to calculate based on the oxygen content that you can read out from the hemoglobin saturation curve let's look at so we do have for example a 30 millimercury of blood 100 ml that takes about 12.4 uh, milliliter per 100 ml blood and we have to look at another one but we do have the fully saturated one that makes about 19.8 so this two value should be added and make an average so that means about 16.1 milliliter oxygen per 100 ml now if you go back what would be the partial pressure on this case you will see that this is less because it takes about 42 millimercury in the arterial blood that is leaving let's see the lung so that is too low it's already much lower than is needed now let's see the oxygen delivery that we do have about four times bigger than the oxygen consumption this is what we said about 25 percent is the extraction normally that we do have in a periphery however when we do have a decreased oxygen delivery what will happen relatively the extraction and uh, the periphery the oxygen extraction is going to increase up to a point and that could be let's see is still normal and there is no lactate no anaerobic conditions in the periphery however when we do drop below a certain rate so as you see here for example when you decrease about almost 50 percent of the normal uh, delivery capacity that increasing the lactate acidosis now the respiratory failure the by definition the respiratory system is no longer able to meet the metabolic demand of the body according to the variation of the artery part pressure of the carbon dioxide respiratory failures are uh, divided into two major categories hypoxia with or without hypercapnia hypoxia when we do have the partial pressure of the arterial oxygen less than 60 millimercury or hypercapnia is called when we do have the partial pressure of the arterial carbon dioxide tension is bigger than 50 millimercury now these can be subclassified into acute and chronic presentation now let's look at this kind of respiratory failure the hypoxemic respiratory failure for example that meaning that we do have only the problem with the oxygen tension usually in type 1 hypoxemic respiratory failure the lung parenchyma is always infected why in the hypercapnic relatively the, the alveoli hyper hypoventilation that is happening so not only the partial pressure of the oxygen tension is dropping below 60 millimercury but 
the carbon dioxide tension is increasing. In the previous situation, when we do have the hypoxemic one, we still can increase the breathing uh, rate. So this way, usually, the PCO2 value is less than 40 millimercury. There are other type of this respiratory failure that call the type 3, that usually is a perioperative respiratory failure, and usually when the, uh, the uh, gut surgery uh, abdominal surgery is happening and after we do have some uh, reversible uh, atelectasia in the lower uh, lobes of the lung and type 4 that usually is uh, connected to the hypoperfuse respiratory failure that due to shock secondary to cardiovascular instability. There are usually that we do have in a mixed form of respiratory failure, most commonly due to the multiple pathophysiological processes can lead to both hypercapnia and hypoxemia. Now in acute or chronic, how can we differentiate between the acute or chronic and depending on the two major failures? Let's see. If we do have a hypercapnic respiratory failure, as you remember, when we do have a low oxygen tension and a high carbon dioxide tension, what, what will happen when we do have, let's see, an acute stage that lasts for minutes to hours? Relatively, there's no compensation. The body cannot compensate. Because what can be the compensation? Relatively, the compensation can be that the kidney is going to excrete the extra acid and making the metabolic bicarbonate value. So the pH starts to increase, the standard bicarbonate is increases, the buffer basis uh, increases, and the base axis be positive. In hypoxemic one, again, in acute one, it's minute to hours and there's no compensation. But when we do have days to months compensation more than one week, what will happen? The hypoxia is going to stimulate the erythropoietin synthesis. Erythropoietin is going to boost, boost the uh, bone marrow, the erythropoiesis. So this way, the hemoglobin concentration is going to increase. Let's see what can cause a hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure. Mostly, as I mentioned, the parenchymal damage, diffusion defect, ventilation perfusion mismatch, right to left shunting mechanism, or when we do have a decrease in inspired oxygen. An acute respiratory failure continuing with the hypercapnic respiratory failure. Mostly, this is a pump failure. In central uh, nervous system disorder, when we do have a reduced drive to breathe, some kind of drugs, depressant drug, or brain, or breast and lesions, stroke, trauma, tumors, hypothyroidism, or neuromuscular diseases, such as some kind of paralytic disorder, as we discussed at the beginning, myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or pyomyelitis, or that's one, or paralytic drugs such as curare, nerve gases, succinyl choline, or the insecticides, uh, drugs that affect neuromuscular transmission, calcium channel blockers, long term adenocorticosteroids, or impaired muscle function, electrolyte balance, malnutrition, chronic pulmonary diseases, this all can uh, alter the pump function. In acute effort, following the acute one, increased workflow breathing, pleural occupying lesion, for example, pleural effusion, hemothorax, pneumothorax, chest wall deformities, the flail chest, or increased airways resistance, or sections, mucosal edema, bron uh, bronchoconstrictions, or lung tissue involvement, such as the interstitial pulmonary fibrotic diseases, or pulmonary vascular problems and pulmonary thromboembolism, or dynamic hyperperfusion, for example, air trapping, or postoperative pulmonary complication that can cause these kind of problems. The classification is based on the mechanical forces. The disease influenced the mechanical forces of the lung, decreased air ventilation, and caused obstructive lung diseases. When we do have the decrease of the amount of air that holding units in the lung, that causes the restrictive lung diseases.
Let's look at the pathophysiology of the respiratory failures. When we do have a diffusion abnormalities, usually the disturbance in the gas transfer across the alveolar capillary bed. Ventilation perfusion imbalance and intrapulmonary shunting mechanism, we do have a problem with matching the pulmonary blood flow and the ventilation. The alveolar hypoventilation when we do have a decreased alveolar ventilation. So these are the three major problems that can develop in the lung. Let's first talk about the diffusion. What's going to influence the gas diffusion across the alveoli and the capillaries? First of all, the thickness of the membrane. That's irreversible or inverse correlation. An area, if you have bigger area, more gas diffuse. If you have less, less gas diffuse. So this uh, correlation is linear. Constant, uh, at a constant of diffusion. For example, the oxygen has worse, let's see, uh, diffusion capability comparing to the, or, or uh, compared to the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide diffusion constant about 50 times higher than oxygen has. And of course, the pressure gradient that is going to in, uh, linearly interfere with the gas diffusion. Now, what can be the possible cause of abnormal diffusion? First of all, the increase of the thickness or the area of this uh, uh, alveoli. Fibrotic tissue or alveolar cell proliferation, thickening of the capillary membrane, intestinal cell edema, the exudates, intraalveolar edema or exudates that can increase the thickening of this, uh, the distance between the alveoli and the capillary. Another important the short, uh, shortening of the contact time. Usually in the normal situation, one third of the contact is enough for a normal diffusion. So the, uh, alveo the arterial partial pressure of the oxygen is still in the normal range. However, when the cardiac output increases, a diffusion relatively, the arterial oxygen tension is decreases when the diffusion is effected. If you increase the inhaled air, oxygen tension in the inhaled air, for sure you are going to increase the gradient, so this oxygenation of the hemoglobin can be normal. This is that shown on the next graph. Normally, when we do have this situation, and it's normal at rest, we do have the normally saturated areas. However, if the patient has a partially affected, let's say, diffusion abnormality, what will happen? At rest, they don't have any problem. However, what will happen when they start to move, start to exercise, or start to walk on stairs? Relatively, the cardiac output increases, the heart rate increases, the contact time decreases, and it's going to decrease, let's see, the oxygenation, and when it's dropping below, let's see, the 60 millimercury, they already had some sign, the hypoxic sign, so that can be the abnormality. When the patient has a completely abnormal gas diffusion capacity, at rest, they do have dyspnea and they do have the sign of hypoxia as well. Let's summarize the effusion, uh, abnormal diffusion. The alveolar oxygen is no pressure, pressure is normal, but the alve arterial oxygen is decreased. So in this case, the gradient or the difference between the alveolar and arterial oxygen is bigger than 20 millimercury. This is what we discussed at the beginning. Usually, this is triggered by exercise when the cardiac output increases. And of course, if you do have increased the oxygen tension in the exhaled air, this is going to improve the oxygenation or the saturation of the hemoglobin. And that's rarely the cause of hypoxia. Usually the ventilatory abnormality is the cause of hypoxia. For the optimal oxygenation, we have to have a normal alveolar ventilation and we have to have a normal perfusion. So, ideal situation, the alveolar capillary exchange unit would have perfect matching of the ventilation and perfusion to ensure the optimum gas exchange across each unit. However, in a normal situation, it's not going to happen because we do have a range. We do have different ventilation perfusion 
ratio in the top and the bottom, but the average on the lung is usually around 1. This is what I meant. In the upper lobe, we do have more ventilated alveoli comparing to the bottom when we do have the diaphragm region more perfused alveoli. So when we are making an average, this average could be around 1. Now, this is the ideal situation when we do have, let's say, the coming, the venosus blood. It's perfusing well the alveoli, and the alveoli is very well ventilated, and this is how normally the arterial blood oxygen contents be normal, the saturation could be normal. However, what will happen when we do have a decreased ventilation, for example, in certain area of the lung? If you do have a decreased ventilation, now because this is the ventilation divided by a perfusion, and if you do have the normal perfusion with less ventilation, it's meaning that this area be less saturated. So now we are going to mix the normally sat normally saturated blood, arterial blood, with a little bit less saturated blood. As the beginning, when we mix these two different a partial pressure of the oxygen blood that you can see that the tension the mix of the tension and the arterial oxygen content be much less of course if you give for example oxygen to this patient that can be proved because this area can be a little bit bigger gradient so it's meaning that you do have a higher oxygenation of this area so you can normalize let's see the oxygen content of the blood but what will happen when we do have an absolute shunt? When we do have a completely locked area that doesn't have any ventilation, it's meaning that this area will have the same kind of venosus, and this venosus blood directly is shunting into the arterial blood, so the oxygen tension is be very low. Now, you can add oxygen, doesn't matter because this cannot prove. So this is an oxygen refractorous because the normally ventilated area already saturating the hemoglobin 100%. So you cannot further increase the oxygen tension. So in this area, for example, you're locking out. What will happen when you do have another problem when you have, let's see, the circulation? is decreased so relatively this area is not circulated and you do have some dead space in the alveolar areas and relatively the oxygen and the air is going to get here as well so the oxygen content of this area is not going to prove too much however the ventilation uh, is not altered however the perfusion is increased so relatively this more perfused area has less contact time so it could in let's say influence the oxygen content but not as much as in another situation now by giving oxygen for example this patient that could prove let's see the oxygenation of the blood now there are some uh, compensatory mechanisms such as for example if an area for example that alveoli doesn't get for example oxygen it doesn't ventilate it properly this let's see blood uh, the vessels is constricted and more blood goes to the very well ventilated area very similarly in this area when we do have let's see a dead space and when the carbon dioxide tension is increases in this area or in the, the vessels that is going to shut down and has some bronchial constriction so less air goes to this area so and another area be more uh, ventilated so that can be the physiological compensatory mechanism in this situation so uh, another thing is uh, the problem, for example, with the matching pulmonary the blood flow and ventilation. In certain diseases, usually that includes the parenchyma, is affected when we do not have a normal balance with the ventilation perfusion and relatively that can alter the oxygenation. And especially the biggest problem when we do have the intrapulmonary shunting mechanism, when directly the venous blood is going to get into, let's see, to the arterioles blood. Now, when you look at, let's see, the oxygen content and the ventilation perfusion ratio, 
this is the ideal one that's a normal situation when we do have the ideal of one if you increase this ventilation perfusion ratio it does not prove too much about the oxygen content however when this ventilation perfusion it's going to decrease you see that the oxygen content of the artery is very much decreased however it's almost no effect of the pco2 the partial pressure of the arterial oxygen tension if you increase the ventilation for sure the arterial uh, carbon dioxide tension is decreases so from this graph you can see that the ventilation is influences mostly the pco2 value However, the ventilation perfusion mismatch is going to alter the oxygen content of the arterial blood. In the next graph, you can see that this is the situation. How, let's see, the alveoli CO2 tension is changing and how the alveoli, let's see, oxygen tension is changing. This is a normal ventilation, around 4 liters per minute. This is needed to maintain the normal carbon dioxide value and the PCO2 value. Now, if you do have a decrease of the ventilation, you can see that is a very much increase of the or alveolar CO2 tension and the arterial CO2 tension. And the arterial CO2 is not influenced too much by the ventilation and perfusion uh, ratio. Now, uh, let's see what will happen when we do have an alveolar hypoventilation. Well, this is going to alter the oxygenation very much. To prevent the development of respiratory acidosis, the carbon dioxide that produced every day around 15 to 17 mole per day must be exhaled by the lung at the same rate. If we do have some parenchymal damage, so, uh, or without any parenchymal damage, let's see what will happen. If we do not have any kind of parenchymal damage, relatively the pump function is abnormal, so it can be due to the control abnormalities, for example, central nervous system or neuromuscular or chest wall or pleura or upper airways obstruction. When we do have some kind of parenchymal damage, such as a small air obstruction, asthma, emphysema or restrictive lung diseases, that's again, it's going to alter the alveoli ventilation. Now, let's see what is the difference between the pump failure and the lung failure. Let's see the lung failure that is causing mostly the impairment of oxygenation. So this kind of respiratory failure usually belongs to the hypoxemic respiratory failure. However, when we do not have a normal ventilation, a pump function is altered, that usually causes hypercapnia as well. Not only the hypoxia, but hypercapnia as well. Now, in adult respiratory distress syndrome, is example for the lung failure or drug overdose is an example for the pump failure. Let's see the following examples. Now, we do have a example of clinical case for the ARDS. It's a 43 years old respiratory therapist with asthma, develops acute exacerbation and aspirates during endotracheal intubation. This kind of swallowing is going to induce inflammatory reaction and causes edema and causes exudate that's going to fill up the alveoli. The following intubation, the progressive severe hypoxia that refractor to oxygen develops. So that looks like we do have a shunting of the venous side to the uh, arterial side, so the right-left shunting mechanism works here. Let's see the lab data. The EBG test with using 100% oxygen shows the arterial oxygen tension is 65 millimercury, but the PCO2 tension is 32 millimercury, and the pH is 7.47, so it's alkali. So it's an alkali one. So we do have a respiratory alkalosis so because due to this hyperventilation now the assisted ventilation that using 100 600 uh, ml per uh, let's say the volume and the respiratory rate is about 18 per minute and when they measure the alveoli or artery gradient that was 56 millimercury as you remember at the beginning we said that if this gradient is greater than 20, 
that should indicate some kind of parenchymal damage. Now the X-ray of the chest shows diffuse alveolar infiltrates. How they manage this patient? Mechanical ventilation, usually the AC ventilation with a volume ventilation. We're using a high uh, oxygen tension with increasing level of the positive end expiration pressure relatively to make, let's see, the alveoli to open up, so decrease the shunting mechanism. And they use aggressive the bronchodilators and uh, to relatively inhibit the bronchospasm and diuresis uh, to, let's see, eliminate these exudates and enteral feeding, a DVT, to prevent the DVT and the GI bleeding using some kind of prophylaxis for this patient. And she recovered later on. Let's look at another one when we do have a pump failure. Now in this case, we do have a 24-year-old white female that injected heroin about half an hour ago and uh, it presents comatosely and shallow irregular respiration. We do see some little tracks uh, and gag reflex is absent completely. The lab indicates that the partial pressure of the arterial oxygen is about 40 millimercury and the PCO2 value is 80. As you see here, that's a hypercapnic hypoxia. The previous was a hypoxemic one and the pH is 7.01. So that's a acidemia due to respiratory acidosis. And when you look at the alveolar and arterial gradient, that's 10 millimercury, showing that there is no Parenheimer problem. And when you look at the X-ray of the chest, that's a completely creel uh, lung. What they use, endotracheal intubation, assisted ventilation, and naloxone to counteract or antagonize the heroin. Now, the mechanical component of the breathing, uh, that's a mechanism that influencing inspiration and expiration. Let's see, what are these mechanical components? We are going to talk about the elasticity, the elasticity of the lung parenchyma or the cavity of the chest, plus the resistance of the airways and other forces against the mechanisms of the respiration. So these are the mechanical components. Now, let's see what factors influencing the elastic recoil. First of all, we do have the surface tension. That's the surfactant. This is a deep halmotate, diphosphatidyl choline, and other lipids and protein that produced usually by the type 2 alveolar cells that makes the alveoli open. And we talk about the tissue elasticity. That's the amount of elastin and the collagen in the tissues. Now, what will happen when we do have a decrease in a surface tension? That can happen, for example, when we do not have the surfactant. It's happening in the in newborn babies. The respiratory distress syndrome is in newborn. When we do not have a normal biosynthetic pathways, for example, for the surfactant, usually happening in the premature babies, and they are giving some steroids to the babies to develop this phospholipid synthesis. And when we do have an activation of the surfactant, uh, or uh, usually when the pathologic mechanical forces used up this against the surfactant, or some other metabolic problems, including acidosis, hypoxemia, or, or decreased venosal circulation, the all is going to alter the surfactant. What will happen? The alveoli collapse, and the total lung capacity decreases, the residual volume decreases as well, and the functional reserve capacity decreases, and the elastic effort is going to increase. Now, in adult case, when we, we could have this uh, respiratory distress syndrome as well, usually what happens when atractasia and lung edema develops? That could be induced by shock any kind of shock, circulatory shock, for example, during their perfusion that induces immune-mediated inflammatory reactions in the lung, for example, and can cause transudate and can cause edema. Trauma, burning, fat explosion, burning, for example, but inhaling, let's see, hot gases that are going to interfere with the surfactant. Fat embolism or crash of lung injury, water aspiration, all things can alter, let's see, and causes the feeling of this alveoli. Infection, sepsis, or inhalation of toxic gases, that I, gases as I mentioned, overdoses, some drugs, barbiturate, salicylate, heroin, tyrosids, and metabolites, so for example, in ketoacidosis, for example, or in 
kidney failure in uremic toxins, but some others, for example, in pancreatitis or disseminated intravascular coagulation or amnion embolization or paraquatoxication. So all can lead to the ARDS, but relatively we do have almost a total right to left shunting mechanism. So relative to the oxygen tension in the arterial blood be very, very low. Now, in the following, we are going to discuss the uh, elasticity decreased due to some tissue problem, such as, for example, the elasticity of the chest cavity decreases in, for example, severe obesity, or when the chest wall is deformed, such as in happening, for example, in ankylosing spondylitis at the Bechterev's diseases, or scoliosis. When you do have, let's see, an altered, let's see, vertebrae structure. Uh, the proto mechanism of ankylosing spondylitis basically somehow the inflammatory reaction of the vertebrae, the small uh, joints, and that can alter completely the structure of the vertebrae and others is affected and uh, finally it's a long-term process when the patient let's see chest or the old structure of the upper part of the body is cannot be moved so the elasticity decreases and the lung parenchymal elasticity could be decreased when it's happening for example in fibrotic diseases or in emphysema Uh, in the following one, the air flow changes. When talking about one, the uh, flow of the air somehow is altered. That happening, for example, in central obstruction when the bigger airways are obstructed. In acute obstruction between the glot glottis and the carina, such as allergic reaction, usually triggered by bites or insects. And uh, this uh, can be, that's an acute, very acute crising situation that can happen, or it can be slowly developing in a chronic form. That, for example, the obstruction due to, for example, tumor. And it can be temporary when we do have a laryngeal spasm. Now, in this link, you can watch how this happening and how this looks like in a situation. I'm showing it right now. This is the appearance of the vocal folds when a person is breathing normally while reading a book, sleeping at night, or even right now as you watch this video. We're going to do a simulated laryngospasm that lasts just 10 or 15 seconds, just to give you the idea of what is happening in the larynx. We're going to see the vocal folds in open normal position for breathing for a couple of breaths, then tightly clamped together for a breath, then a little more open as the laryngospasm is beginning to relax, a little more open again, and then back to a fairly normal breathing position. One simply wants to breathe normally, but instead the vocal folds spasm to close the vocal folds. Air is shut off completely, and the person makes a funny noise like <coughs> or <coughs> they may cough and struggle for a very frightening minute. It can seem like one is going to die. Most people who experience this understandably panic. People around them panic. The first time or two in particular, they may call 911. But long before the ambulance arrives, the whole problem is over. Occasionally, these episodes of laryngospasm happen in a series.
In other words, one may have a tough, frightening minute of this sudden Charlie horse of the larynx, then the breathing gets a little better, and then another laryngospasm happens right on the, the tail end of the first one to repeat the cycle. Okay, so dominant ventilator disorders include some the obstructive lung diseases such as the asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, this is called the COPD, that includes the chronic bronchitis, emphysema, or bronchiolitis obliterans, these are the irreversible uh, obstructive diseases, and cystic fibrosis. The restrictive one, when the lung parenchyma is affected, this kind of, for example, when we do have a diffuse parenchymal lung disease, such as the interstitial lung diseases, sarcoidosis, lung infections, uh, CVD-associated lung diseases, or bronchialveolar carcinoma, and at so on, at so on. Now, the reversibility uh, of obstructive lung disease is why the uh, irreversible, the COPD. The COPD, when the airways, and mostly the small airways, is completely restructured and fibrotically narrowing these airways. These airways lost the elasticity required due to the alveolar destruction and the alveolar support that maintains patency of the small airways. Reversibility, such as the bronchial asthma, that's an accumulation of the inflammatory cells, mucus, and exudates in the bronchi. A smooth muscle cell contraction that happening and triggered by this allergic reaction in the peripheral and the central airways, and usually is dynamic hyperinfiltration during this exercise. Now, what will happen in a COPD? In COPD, is a long term that takes months or years when usually the failure develops. It's decades when it start to develop a complete uh, narrowing of the small airways. Now, let's talk about first the obstructive lung disease, the COPD. That's an accumulation of symptoms that are produced by respiratory diseases that results in a diagnosis of the COPD. Chronic bronchitis and emphysema, these are the two situations that usually the most common one that can, help, uh, that can uh, cause the COPD. The COPD, that's a respiratory disorder of syndromes that rather is a disease state that the syndromes usually associated with some other clinical signs as well. Now, let's see the symptoms of the COPD. Usually, that's characterized of two concepts. Decreased expiration airflow pressure and increased resistance to the expiratory airflow. These problems are caused by airways obstruction and determining the specific respiratory diseases. Now, let's see the chronic obstructive diseases. When we do have an increased bronchial fluids, inflammation, thickening of the bronchial wall, hypertrophy of the small muscle cells, that causing the thickening of the sign and discrepancy between the protease and antiprotease activity, and that causes, uh, the protease activity causes the alveolar damage. And that's damage continuously repeating, and that process is going to, chronic process is narrowing to the small airways, by inflammation and causes fibrosis and the resistance of the airways increases. Usually as this kind of process it causes a mixed form of uh, COPD. So not a whole pump function failure but because the parenchyma is affected as well fibrotically that can be a mixed form. Now let's talk about a little bit about the hypercapnia because COPD usually caused, uh, causes hypercapnia because the ventilation is altered. Now this kind of equation only showing you that what is going to alter the alveolar CO2 tension. First of all, we are talking about, let's see, the CO2 production or what is produced. That production is usually based on the basal metabolic rate and the respiratory work as well. Plus, we do have the alveolar gas exchange. That usually the respiratory volume minus the residual. This is how the air volume is affected. Now, normally the respiratory work is less than 2% of the basal metabolic rate. However, when the palm body develops a hypoxia, that will stimulate the respiration and that can cause 
type now. However, because the airway is obstructed, this is why the physical activity increases. So this is why this, for example, the CO2 production is increased by the muscle activity. So and that respiratory verse can exceed the 20% and that causes pathological condition. So hyperventilation cannot decrease the arterial CO2 tension because of the rate of the CO2 production is more. Now, what kind of compensatory mechanism can uh, be when we do have an increase uh, P uh, artery, uh, alveolar CO2 tension? When we do have a hypoventilated alveoli, the CO2, was, CO2 level increases, and that can increase, let's say, the bicarbonate level, especially due to the kidney compensation, and that is going to uh, decrease the stimulation of the breathing center. So this kind of patient usually lives with a cyanosis, with a hypoxia, and due to the hypoxemia in the chronic situation, the erythropoietin level increases and the red blood cell production increases. So this patient has polycythemia and core pulmonale because the peripheral resistance increases and that finding up with the edema. And this kind of patient has is called the blue bloater type. Now, this is how the patient looks like. And that's a clear form of a COPD that usually due to this bronchitic phenotype and usually the long history of coughing and sputum production and the patient usually has a frequent exacerbation of the acute episodes. Uh, less dyspnea and chronic hypoxia, pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonale and right-sided heart, heart failure and this patient usually is obese and sitting and coughing. Then, uh, in chronic bronchitis, uh, we do have in a practical notes already, I mentioned that this is a clinical diagnosis. It's not an absolute diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis. And based on that the patient had, let's see, a chronic coughing, that this chronic coughing lasted more than 90 days on the two consecutive years. Of course, we have to rule out the TBC, the tuberculosis, the tumor, or congestive heart failures as well. Mostly is due to the smoking, air pollution, and some occupational exposure. Pathologic changes, as we do have now, the increase in the mucous glands in the airways, the mucous accumulation in small airways, and in a small uh, diameters airways, less than two millimeters is narrowing one, but it cannot be altered because this mucus is filling up the airways. So the patient, this is why, it has to live together with an increased small airways resistance. Now, this kind of blue water type is usually hypoxemic and they do have a right heart failure. Now, the other type that usually has only hypoxia and they do have a normal CO2 value. Why? Because the patient applies some tehypnoe. So, they still can compensate by increasing the respiratory rate however the workload is be higher so in this way the alveoli co2 tension can be normal this patient won't be cyanotic there is no polycythemia no edema and this kind of type is called the pink puffer type Now, the peak puffer type or the emphysematosus type uh, has a long history or exertional dyspnea, and usually they don't have sputum or they have very small amount of sputum. Uh, infrequent exacerbation, hyperinfiltration occurs, and they are using the accessory muscle to apply more force for the pumping mechanism. What they apply, this kind of purse lip breathing, so they are applying the positive end uh, pressure exhalation and they are going to decrease the pressure gradient to the airways and this is why the uh, usually the uh, the collapsion occurs now in the cartilage area when we do have the heart cover because the airways usually is collapsed when the 
intra-bronchial and the extra-bronchial pressure be equal. Those are the equal pressure point. That in this case, for example, if emphysema, because the elasticity decreases, and this point is false in the terminal bronchial line, that we do have the collapsion. And because we do have the collapsion, what the patient can do, now applying the purse lip, uh, lips breathing, they will decrease this gradient, and now is shifting, let's see, this collapsion to the heart cover area, but what they do, they are puffing puff, 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 all the time. So, but because she is he is hyperventilating, that is going to cause let's see that extra uh, metabolism capacity. So these are the patient usually is thin and they do have a weight loss. Emphysema, the abnormal a permanent enlargement of the air space because the elasticity decreases. So the distal usually to the terminal bronchial line that this is where the collapse occurs. Because the residual volume increases, they are going to rupture, let's see, the wall and they are opening up and usually the septum is injured and what to happening? The elimination of pulmonary capillary bread increased volume in the SNI, sinus with the development of the blaps airspace near pleura and boule large air spaces, and the mechanical decrease in the air waste caliber, compression of SNI, loss of elastic recoil. So that's be the complete situation in emphysema. And usually emphysema and bronchitis, there's a mixed form in a lot of people because in elderly vibe aging, the emphysema is a normal process, the elasticity decreases, and plus usually they are taking the pollution, air pollution, or cigarette smoking, so that other, that usually we do have a mixed form. Now let's see the type of emphysema. Depending on where this acinase is opening up, we can talk about the central lobular or uh, centriacinar emphysema, usually the upper lobes or the superior segments of the lower lobes involved, highly associated with smoking, this type, or we can have a pan lobular that usually ever is happening. This entire acinase, even in the earlier stages, usually it's associated with the homozygous form of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and we can have the distal acinar or periacinal or paraceptal or subleural emphysema that involves the distal alveolar sacs and the ducts, usually in upper lobes and often subleural or along fibrotic intralobular septa, typically seen in young adult with a history of spontaneous pneumothorax. Now, the pattern mechanism of the emphysema usually the imbalance between the naturally occurring proteases and antiproteases. In the alveolar destruction occurs when the protease uh, activity be higher, that released out from the neutrophils due to the inflammatory reaction, and that can, for example, triggered by pollution or triggered by smoking, the, uh, the free radicals. And that's usually the protease that's inhibited by the alpha-1 antitrypsin, but this smoking as radicals is altering the antitrypsin uh, activity, and this is why the protease activity be higher, and the patient elasticity or elastase enzyme activity be higher, so the elasticity is going to decrease. Now that's be the pink buffer, as you do see here, the elastic recoils or elastic tissues decreases. This is why the residual volume increases, the area of the alveoli decreases, and they are rupturing, and this is how the emphysema is going to develop. Now, bronchiectasia. Uh, bronchiectasia, relatively the normal permanent dilation of the bronchi and the bronchioles caused by destruction of the muscle and the elastic tissue as a result from a chronic necrotizing infection. It is usually a secondary condition, not a primary disease. Diagnosed by the history or persistent cough and plurent sputum, an imaging x-ray showing the dilated bronchial and bronchioles. Clinical consequence of the chronic and recurrent infection and pooling of the secretion in dilated airways. It is a disorder that typically affects the older individuals. Approximately about two-thirds of the patients are women. This is the picture, how it looks like using the CT. You can see the open and big airways.
Let's look at what are the predisposing factors for bronchial ectasia. First of all, the bronchial obstruction can be tumors or any kind of foreigner body. Congenital or hereditary conditions such as the cystic fibrosis or some immune deficiency or Kutcher-Geiger syndrome. That's a primary ciliary dyskinesia when the cleaning of the airways is abnormal. Necrotizing or suppurative pneumonia, staphylococci or Klebsiella and other bacteria as well. Now, the pattern mechanism that's involved any kind of infectious agent that this infection is going to maintain the inflammation, that can be due to some bacteria, some kind of agents or infecting agent, but it can be autoimmune as well. Now, the basically the impaired clearance that's be the basically the big, biggest problem, and this is how the bronchitis is going to dilate, 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 and the wall of the broad high is going to be disrupted due to the uh, proteases that is released out from these inflammatory cells and this is going to be a circus viciosus that is going to maintain and finally is ending up with the bronchiectasia that is going on by decades to decades. The asthma. Asthma is a reversible airflow obstruction manifested by wheezing and caused by a combination of airway mucosal edema and inflammation. This common disease affects about 5% of the adults and 7-10% to of children. The increased secretions and smooth muscle contraction that's a hallmark of the asthma. Because of asthma is a heterogeneous disease triggered by a variety of initiating agents uh, there, uh, there is no universal accepted simple classification. Nonetheless, it is customary to classify asthma into basically two major categories based on the presence or absence of the underlying immune disorders. This is how they categorize them as extrinsic asthma, then we do have some kind of triggering mechanism, and intrinsic asthma that is internally occurs, there is no the trigger agent, but it's today's is less commonly used, but only that saying that possible we do not know that say the triggering mechanism for this intrinsic asthma. Now, extrinsic asthma or atopic asthma, in which the asthmatic episodes is typically initiated by type 1 hypersensitivity reaction induced by exposure to the extrinsic antigen. The types of extrinsic antigen can be, for example, anything. This onset is first two decades of the light associated with allergic manifestation. That can be occupational asthma, many forms, so the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, for example. In a serum, Ig level, IgE level are usually elevated, as if the blood eosinophil count is elevated as well. This form of asthma is believed to be delivered by the CD4 plus cells and goes through the T helper to type cells. Now, the inflammatory mechanism of extrinsic asthma has an early stage and a later stage. In an early stage that is mediated by the IgE and the degranulation of histiocytes and those uh, histamines and serotonin and other agents, and that's causing bronchospasm. And the late one that occurs after the onset of four to eight hours, and the mechanism is unknown but usually is connected to the eosinophils. Multiple cells taking place in the development of asthma, macrophages, eosinophils, histiocytes, and T lymphocytes, and many mediators, cytokines, growth factor, enzyme, and superoxides are involved following various airways challenges like antigens, chemical exposure, or exercise. At least six, six separate stats in this complex chain of even have been identified today. Now, the early stage, that's the antigen-induced mast cell degranulation, releases of the histamine, another mediator, which causes bronchospasm, either directly or through neural reflexes. The late stage, the factors, the eosinophils and other inflammatory cells, and these many cause damage to the epithelium, producing chronic inflammatory processes that go going to restructure the airways later on by decades to decades so that's be some irreversible let's see proportion of the asthmatic uh, airways uh, resistance 
Now, what will happen? An initiation, what we do here, that's the degranulation of the mast cells and releasing the histamine, bradykinin, leukotrines, prostaglandins, uh, tromboxin, or chemotactic factors. And that's the airway smooth muscle contraction. The permeability of the vascular increases and mucus secretion increases. That's be the early phase. And later on, the late asthmatic attack that occurs for eight hours after the eosinophils that releases mediator, the trash airways epithelium uh, basically are destroyed the cilia and loss of the epithelium exposed nerve endings, increased cytokines production, and further inflammation is coming ahead, and further bronchospasm and paras uh, initiating the parasympathetic activation. And again, the histamine, leukotriene, and other, and that's recruit again eosinophils and start everything from the beginning. Now, the intrinsic asthma, well, how they called it, used to be, uh, in which the triggering mechanisms are non immune. We don't know yet what is going to trigger it. In this form, a number of stimuli that have little or no effect on the normal subject can trigger bronchospasm, such as, for example, aspirin or pulmonary infection, especially those used by viruses, cold, uh, psychological stress, exercise, inhaled irritants, ozone, sulfur dioxide. And there is usually no personal or family history of allergic manifestation, and the serum Ig level are normal. These patients are said to have an asthmatic diathesis. Diathesis is elegantly the term of the predisposing uh, predisposition. Now, asthma uh, or the aspirin induced asthmatic attack possibly is due to the leukotriene, elevated leukotriene level that directly has a bronchospasm activity. Let's see the interstitial lung diseases. This interstitial lung diseases, we use the name for the large group of diseases that inflame or scar the lung. The inflammation and the scarring make it hard to get enough oxygen. Usually the diffusion is altered. Causes include autoimmune diseases or occupational exposure to the molds, gases or foam farms. Some types of intestinal lung diseases have no known cause or we haven't discovered yet. Pathomechanism that the interstitium is all very involved the injury that occurs initially, that is activated the type 1 alveolar epithelial cells or capillary endothelium, that is going to have an edema or hemorrhage. The fibrin deposition around the alveolar wall, the highly membrane, so the diffusion is not involved. And the inflammatory phase, the infiltration of neutrophils that gather there, macrophages, lymphocytes, releasing out cytokines that influence the subsequent intensity and duration or disease process and fibrosis and the repair mechanism. The inflammatory process subsides proliferation of the type 2 alveolar cells and organization of the fibrinose exudates occur, collagen deposited and distortion of the lung architecture and enlargement of the alveolar air spaces. The subsequent inflammatory processes promote the lung damage, and this is how the circus physiosis is by time is going to destroy the epithelial epithelium of the lung. Thank you very much. That was today. Have a nice day.